Okay, let me just start the commentary here. So this thumbnail, this guy here, the guy in the middle, the Indian soldier that's being swarmed by bees. So that was actually inspired by um, Platoon, the movie Platoon, uh, where uh, Willem Dafoe is getting shot up by the Viet Cong and he has his arms out to the side in like a really dramatic pose um, here, actually. Like this pose where he's like getting shot up and he's it's really dramatic. He like flings his arms up in the air. That whole scene. That's kind of like what inspired this, but bees. I thought that was hilarious. Let's get started. I was looking through my YouTube analytics the other day and discovered two things. One, not nearly enough of you are subscribed. Oh, yeah. I, I always have like little Easter eggs in my videos, right? So first and foremost, I did um, inspect element to change my estimated revenue. So don't be no nosy, just in case people are like pausing the video to try to see all my statistics and stuff. So that's like the first little fun thing. Yo is unacceptably masculine and would easily make my channel the lamest frat party on campus. Another little Easter eggs here. So if anyone's been to college, Natty Lights, go to beer of college. So I've had a lot of those in here. And then I just like made up a, like a little funny Greek life thing. I had another idea to do for this where it was like Alpha Sigma Tango 12 o'clock or something exclamation point like they're like calling out like it's the military or something. Now to solve this, I did some research on female dominated YouTube categories and found some topics like beauty, style, East Asian. It was actually really hard to find statistics on female dominated YouTube categories. I did more research for this part of my video than some of the actual history parts. So I, I found like a statistic breaking it down. I don't know how accurate it is because their sources just like Google analytics and I'm like, okay, well, can I look at that? I, I really go in depth looking and doing research for all of my stuff. So info for history, that's just kind of like anywhere. It could be Reddit, books that I've read, research that I've done, really kind of all over the place. It's not really like one specific source. A lot of the times video ideas come from you guys recommending it for me. And then when I do my research, I try to go for like, you know, I do some basic stuff like, you know, Wikipedia, look into some just like basic sources. And then from there, I try to like fact check and verify things that sound unbelievable, um, which was like most heavily done in my strange duels video, because this was like the most obscure video topic that I've had probably so far where I was literally translating French court documents for some of the stories. So I definitely do some in-depth research if I want to verify some stuff. But at some point, you're kind of just like, all right, it's hard to know whether something is 100% factual or a little bit fabricated just for the sake of, you know, a fun story. But you can't really tell because you don't have enough information about it. So you just kind of say, all right, I'll teach it because it's a fun story, but make a caveat or just the disclaimer that there is some doubt around Around it. And sometimes you get really bummed because you'll read about a story that you really like that ends up turning out to be kind of false and you can't make it into a video. So like I have that all the time. Anyway, enough of monologuing. Let's continue here. Oh, Henry Cavill. Someone was mad that I didn't have Ryan Reynolds. I did Henry Cavill though. I think this explains why my recent videos have thankfully brought in more ladies. Now it's just about keeping this momentum going until I hit a 50-50. So yes, my female analytics has been improving. Look at this. We're up to 20%. We're almost there. I need that 50-50. It's getting better. <laughs> I just want to make sure that it's not like something that like absurdly annoys me. I understand that this kind of content kind of like skewers a little bit more towards the male category, but I like to think that my content is kind of like very widely applicable for all kinds of people to enjoy. At least I try to make it that. It, it kind of makes me happy to see like things even out a little bit, especially like age demographics. I was always happy because my age demographics are actually not like the 13 to 17 that a lot of YouTubers have, like, you know, like the Jake Pauls of the world. Why do I want 50-50? Just to like, you know, know that I'm welcoming to everyone and not just like only targeting one demographic. Now, I've had people criticize me for having intros like this and saying I should get rid of them to make it faster because that's kind of like what the YouTube meta is nowadays where it's like you start off from the get-go, you hit the ground running immediately into the topic, you don't stop, pedal to the metal, but damn, I just love that like salsa music and Blue Jay video. I don't think I'll ever get rid of it. Uh, programs, I use Adobe stuff. So Photoshop, I draw. Premiere, I do the video. Disgust for the state of Missouri. Thinking they're hot stuff with their stupid bendy tube in the sky. They just drive by and say, haha, look, it's like McDonald's. McDonald's but half before heading on to a better state. Well, luckily, you can both satisfy your itch for strategy and urge to level the state of Missouri in Conflict of Nations World War Three. Okay, so about that, so the Missouri thing, the only reason like that I shit on Missouri so hard. So when you start out as Illinois in Conflict of Nations, the like tutorial battle that it had me do was Missouri was invading me. And so I had to attack Missouri and I was filming myself playing this game, right? And so because I just so happened to be fighting Missouri, 
Mercury for like a little transition into the into the sponsor, I was like, all right, what if I just make a joke that I just hate Missouri and that if you also hate Missouri, you can destroy Missouri in this game. So I have like literally nothing against Missouri in the slightest, but I decided to flame them as hard as I could. <laughs> and I had a lot of comments about that, which was hilarious. Was Ancient Egypt. Cool place, right? I mean, how could you not love what's basically a Yu-Gi-Oh theme park? The <laughs> that was actually, um, I had a lot of fun Ancient doing this. Egypt. I was basically cool looking place, for right? pictures I mean, that had similar Yu-Gi-Oh counterpart pictures. So obviously the pyramid was what came to mind when I was writing this. But then for the other pictures, I was looking for like, okay, let's see. I, I, I googled Yu-Gi-Oh Egypt, got some pictures like this, you know, Yugi or Yami on the throne because he was like a pharaoh in the show or something. Uh, this picture, hieroglyphs in the background. This is the wing dragon of Ra, I think, or the wing. It's one of like the three Egyptian god cards that is like a central theme in that show. And so this one fit perfectly. I was really proud of like that transition from just like the hieroglyphs and then it kind of like perfectly blended in like colors and all into the Yu-Gi-Oh version. And then I was looking for a picture of a pharaoh on a throne and that was as close as I can get. It was really hard to get a good Place, picture right? of that. But you know, it was a fun little transition. I like to do like little, like good fluid transitions in my videos. They made them pets, made them mummies, made them cops. Baboon police was a thing. Look up. But nothing quite it was. It was a cats. thing. Basically, baboons were the used to catch thieves cops, in ancient police. Egypt, as displayed in this hieroglyph. This is like the equivalent of an Egyptian cop, and he has pet baboons that chase down people that steal things. I didn't do heavy research into this topic, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but I certainly had fun drawing a baboon as a cop with aviators. It's the 6th century BCE, and the Persians are looking at everything not Persia, noting the unacceptable lack of Persianness, which can only be fixed with the addition of yet more Persia. And next in line for their Persian conversion excursion was their cat-loving neighbors down south. Yeah, I'm a really big fan of rhyming. <laughs> if you can't tell, I like to do that in my videos. So Persian conversion excursion. Young Egyptian pharaoh Samtek III at his fortified position at Pelusium, according to stratagems by... Uh... <laughs> so... <clears throat> Polyenus. That little bit was actually improved a little bit. So I was reading through the script and I got to this and I was like, wait, I actually have never looked up how to pronounce this guy's name. <laughs> and so I, I was like, wait a second. And then I Googled it and I couldn't find like a video that like does a pronunciation because you can always find like pronunciation videos on YouTube. This guy's like a little bit more obscure, I guess. So I can only find like the Wikipedia, like breaking down the sounds with consonants type thing that I just showed. Um, So that was actually like a little bit of improv there. That wasn't in the script originally. I just kind of came up with that. Oh, we thought you said paper mache. What? So you didn't build my weapon or bring any cats? Oh no, we brought cats. We always bring cats. I think you missed a golden opportunity with catapult, sir. Shut the fuck up. Grab the kittens. What? Grab the fucking kittens, Pulvisius. In one of the first- Okay, so when I make a video or make a topic into a video, what I like to look for when reading is like some kind of central joke or like if I'm reading a story and then I think of some funny joke or skit idea around it, I build the rest of the video topic around that joke idea. So when I was reading into this, I um, or reading into the story about the Battle of Pelusium and hearing how they use cats, I liked to imagine the idea that the king like brought some other kind of cat based weapon that ended up not working out. And so he's like, ah, oh, fuck it, just grab the cats. Let's bring them to the front lines. <laughs> and so I, I basically just wrote like that little idea gave me the inspiration to make an entire video around it. And Bices II had his men paint the image of Bastet on the front of their shields and spread cats and other animals before their front lines. The Egyptian defense, upon seeing this display, refused to fight for fear of hurting the animals or striking the image of their goddess. So I try to be accurate with my character drawings, by the way. So I think these guys, I was inspired by the Persian immortals. I, I saw a picture of a Persian immortal with armor that looks similar to this. It was kind of like a studded leather vest, green belt, just kind of like this maroon tunic underneath. So because of that, I decided to draw the character in that sense. The Egyptians had like really similar looking armor. I just decided to just kind of like go with that civilian Egyptian that I drew earlier to save some time and then give them some rock hard abs because it's fucking awesome. But then also like the weapons, like the shields, I tried to be kind of accurate with like the shape of them. I will say there are some like liberties that I took. Like for example, the Persian shields would have a little indent in them, kind of like a little semicircle cut out where they could stick their spears and stabby stabby. Uh, I didn't draw that because I just didn't really want to. And then these spears are not what like Persian spears looked like, but I just kind of thought they looked cool. So I drew it like that.
that. These spheres kind of looked more like what the Egyptian spheres looked like in the pictures that I saw, so I, I tried to do that a little bit accurately. Resulting in the surrender of Pelusium. This left many Egyptians to be massacred as they retreated to Memphis, okay. which would fall shortly. So, researching this story, there is, obviously there's some discrepancy on the accuracy of it. The guy that wrote the story wrote it, like, I think a, a few hundred years after the fact. I believe it said the date on that uh, Stratagems of War book was like 100 AD. Um, maybe it's not on here. Anyway, but he's a trusted advisor, military advisor, so I think his word is worth a grain of salt. Some people are kind of like against it, saying that it's not all that accurate. Some of the versions of the stories that I heard say that they ran around with the cats and threw them at the Egyptians. I find that part a little less believable. I kind of went with the version of the story that I found the most believable and was also written by a rather trustworthy source, I would say, that they spread cats, but not only cats, just animals in general, whatever they get their hands on, on their front lines, and then painted the image of their goddess on their shields if they could. I'm sure not every single shield had it painted on them, but basically that's the version of the story that I decided to tell because I believed that to be the most accurate. Those of their gods to be protected at all costs, else risk the eternal damnation of their soul. So switch out cats with Zoe Kravitz's cat woman and you get the idea. So basically the idea there is the Egyptians, so they didn't necessarily worship animals, like they didn't go and pray and bow down to them. If you look at this picture, this is actually, um, that's a symbol of their god and not like a cat that she's bowing down to. But they respected animals and it was considered a, well, it was a crime to harm animals. And in one instance, I, I wasn't able to find like a source for it, but some historian was writing how even striking an image of their god would be a capital punishment in some instances. Or harming an animal, killing a cat could be a death sentence in ancient Egypt. So that's kind of why a lot of people were scared to attack because, you know, killing an animal could be seen as a death sentence. Although, you know, you probably kind of wonder to yourself a little bit. Yeah, that's a death sentence, but so is surrendering and potentially literally getting killed. And I'm sure some like laws are like thrown out the window in, in times of war. But regardless, this is how the story was reported. And I'm sure there are plenty of people in the Egyptian army that held the religious reservations to harming animals. It, at heart and why they decided to not fight. And they're probably already not in a good enough shape to want to keep fighting anyway, because they were fighting beforehand. It's not like they just walked up with cats and won. They, they were fighting. So maybe things weren't going well. And that was kind of like the last nail in the coffin. What if I told you that the first successful combat submarine was actually built from an old steam boiler by a bunch of Southern boys in Alabama? I'm talking, of course, about the HL Hunley. So I actually forgot to make a note on the screen, but there is some discrepancy on how accurate that is. The fact that it was built from an old steam boiler. So a a lot of sources said that they did, but there was one really trustworthy source that said that they didn't, and that's just a legend. But a lot of trustworthy sources said that it did, including like the actual website for the H.L. Hunley Museum. So I was like, all right, I'm going to kind of go with it because it's kind of funny. Good luck on the test, Hunley. <laughs> Don't worry, I invented this thing. <laughs> okay, you go get him. <laughs> I will, Charles. <laughs> okay, Clyde, get the crane ship. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with that. It's actually a little hard to do because I, I was like, all these lines were recorded at the same distance to my mic, but I had to do some like shenanigans with um like a, a generic high pass where I'm basically like, I'm taking down the fr like the, the magnitude of the higher frequency sounds on the, the audio lines of Horace Hunley here to make it sound like it's far away. But the thing you gotta be careful with is if you do that too much, it starts to sound like it's just like inside of a car car um like inside of a container rather than far away so you got to do like a little bit and then kind of like lower just the volume in general to kind of get like a sort of artificial distance sound effect and then i kind of like scaled that as he flew off here a spar torpedo which was essentially a bomb uh, attached to the end of a wooden stick. A spear, but with an aftertaste, if you will. So, a little bit more on uh, this, because you might be wondering, like, why the fuck would they poke a boat with a bomb and detonate it and just think they'd be fine? And I don't know, but I do know that the original plan for a spar torpedo that they ended up not doing on this expedition, for whatever reason, was you have the barbs here, you'd go up to the ship and you'd stick it in the ship, but then as you back away, it detaches from the rod. Right, exactly. So the stick detaches from the bomb and then a cord, which can be anything in various instances, but in this case it was supposed to be electronically wired, would 
continue to the ship so that the ship could back up and get to a safe enough distance before detonating the bomb. And they either had this set up and it failed and they just like were scared and clicked faster than they expected, or they decided to have it a, like an impact detonation. But for whatever reason, it didn't separate and they didn't go away from the bomb. So it just exploded on impact. This plan is genius. Them Yanks can't even touch us. <laughs> you got that rat, Cletus. You got that rat. <laughs> All right, boys, we're about to deliver the payload. <laughs> In three, two, one. The torpedo made contact with. So, okay, lots of breakdown there. So, first off, this video was by far my favorite to do voice acting in. I had so many opportunities to do fun voices like these southern voices, the pirate voice, which destroyed my throat. The, um, later on, the bee. Earlier on, Kimbysis II talking about using a kitten trebuchet, which is actually inspired a little bit by the voice of Dr. Bees. Um, so I had a lot of Dr. Bees influence in this whole video. But, um, so why did they shoot at it? How did they know? Well, they noticed the ship coming towards them it was you know a submarine but it didn't go that far under the water and for the most part it kind of like skimmed across the top because it didn't really need to go underneath when you don't have much of a threat when you're that low on the water line they could see it coming towards them chugging away and i mean you see that and you they didn't actually think it was a whale that was mostly a joke but um yeah so they did whatever they could which was just fire away with rifles and pistols and whatever they could get their hands on but the guns on the ship weren't you know made to lower that far to actually shoot at it so that's why they they shot it's at it and why they couldn't do that. fire like the big guns. Also, this whole segment <laughs> was, it took a little bit of creativity because you have different, so I don't do frame by frame animation all that often. I did it in this video a little bit, which you'll see a little bit later, but um, I have, you know, like static frames that kind of move quickly enough to feel like animation without being, you know, a dirty frame for se for a second video. So for these, because I had frames kind of like moving out of sync, instead of just drawing like two frames of everything where one had their arms up and one had their arms down cranking away on the ship I lassoed out these faces with masks and um, I had a base animation where it was just these flat or these blank like people going up and down up and down up and down and then I pasted the faces on top of them and uh, that was kind of fun to put together but um also on the shockwave account so there's actually a really good video by Mark Rober that kind of breaks this down a little bit so if you watch this video it actually uh, breaks down why bombs in water are really dangerous um, so basically it has to do with your body composition and so you know how your body is like 70% water so when you're in a medium of fluid that is a similar viscosity and density to the makeup of an object the shock waves are able to propagate it or propagate through it very effectively um so like in this video you can see like a little demonstration with a balloon kind of like talking about what he means but let's see here so I don't want to watch this whole video but he demonstrates it with a balloon and you can kind of see exactly how the shock waves would move through your organs. Here you go. So a bomb next to air. Nothing really happens. You see how the balloons didn't move or shake at all, but in the water. All right. So this is the air. These water balloons, um, because the shockwave is going through air, doesn't really go through them and affect them all that much. But when it's in the water, because the balloons are filled with water, the shockwave bounces around inside these water balloons, which are really simulating your organs, or they're simulating, I guess, the air in your body. Never mind, I lied. Um, so like your lungs, and it just kind of ruptures them and does you dirty like that. So the way that I'm seeing it is because you're right, they're not in water. I wonder if there was a flood in the ship that could have caused this. But regardless, even if they weren't, were, so the shockwave would travel farther through the water, I believe, in general, to get to them easier. And then it would start going through the ship, through the air of the ship, unless the ship was flooded somewhat. But uh, regardless, it basically like put them approximately closer to the bomb than you would typically imagine if they were in air. And so because the payload was just so large in general, even if they were in air above ground, and it still probably would have done some serious damage to their internal organs. We actually didn't know what happened to the crew of the H.L. Hunley until like the like 2000 or something when they found the wreckage and they brought it up and noticed that all of the bodies were inside and like their bones were all there. They died at on the spot, but there were no there was no damage to the actual structure of the the metal frame. So they realized okay they didn't sink the the ship didn't explode. So what happened was the shockwave going through the ship had to have ruptured their internal organs and killed them 
on the spot, so they all just died and, you know, decomposed in their seats. The loving land of traitors gets to claim the world's first successful combat submarine, uh, but if it makes you feel any better, populating the high seas with over four times more rebel corpses than Union ones is about the most goddamn American thing you can do. That was fun to <laughs> Photoshop too. I was a little worried that there might be some people from the southern states that would get offended, like thinking that I'm saying I hate people from the south. I do not. I, I do hate Confederates though. Just want to make sure that's clear. By the way, we ain't get a bit offshore. Are there any mines in the harbor? Yes. They met up with a sneaky little jerk. <laughs> Those accents I was really worried to do because um, I felt like I was starting to sound a little Australian with the British one. And I'm, I'm like really hit or miss with my German accents. Some Sometimes I can do it really, really well. Sometimes I feel like I kind of missed the mark. But yeah, I was kind of proud with it. And then there's like some times where I feel like it shines through a little bit better. Like the that will be great line, like right here. I feel like I did that pretty well. Back over there. Uh, is that okay with you? Ja, ja, that, mm, that would be great. Perfect. Like that. I was kind of proud of that. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. Okay. You're right, Ace. I am proud of my jokes. I make these videos for me a lot of the time. Like all these jokes in my videos are like, I find these freaking hilarious. And a lot of the times people don't like love my favorite jokes in the video. They love something else. Like usually the things that I'm like, okay, this is probably gonna be a crowd favorite joke. Like the, um, the whiplash here. A lot of people really liked this where they had the shockwave go through and kill them. You know, it's a quick loud shock laughter thing. I get it. Um, my favorite joke in this video is it's hard to say because I, I love them all. They're like all my babies, but I think is like the it's coming up southern prong who weren't having as much luck so okay basically the way that i see making videos you can do it like one of two ways you can think what do people really like what is popular right now what do people find funny how can i make the best jokes and i'll find myself doing that from time to time but then i'll just kind of remember eh, i don't really find this all that funny or i find this really really funny while other people find it funny but the ultimately the answer is you shouldn't really care because what you should do is try to build a community around people that have a similar sense of humor to you or value the same things that you you do so that no matter what you do, no matter what topic you cover, no matter what video you make, you'll have people that are similar enough to you that'll pretty generally like whatever you put out there. So I make videos that I find really, really funny. I make jokes that I find really, really funny in the hopes that it reaches other people who have this similar sense of humor and will then just kind of like whatever I put out there. And that's kind of how I view making these jokes. Perhaps it was just a desperate attempt to remedy a battlefield woefully underpopulated by bees. That is a Dr. Bees reference. And for those of you who haven't seen it, Dr. Bees is my favorite YouTube video and superhero of all time by Harry Partridge. Please watch it. Dr. Bees and Dr. Bees Returns. These two are so freaking good. <laughs> I, I love it so much. Harry Partridge is hilarious and is like my sense of humor to the T. And yes, I, I do like sarcastic humor hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like someone's a little lost. The Indian. <laughs> okay, that was that's probably my favorite. <laughs> that's my probably my favorite skit in the whole video. I was just really proud of it. I don't know if it's necessarily that I think that the the joke itself was the funniest joke in the video, but I was just really happy with how it turned out because this is frame by frame animation right here by the when way, he's running. <laughs> So I was like really happy that that turned out looking as well as it did. And uh, so I think that's like a big reason why I liked it. I had originally written this joke, imagine it being very visual, which is always something that I try to avoid doing when it comes to my skits because it requires more intensive and skilled animation. And for as much as I draw and animate and as much as I've definitely improved over the course of my videos, I don't really consider myself like a full on skilled animator like Harry Partridge's with these videos. Like these are insane. So like I try not to go too out there with my skits and how they look so it's hard to like visually have humor in my videos I would say I guess it's usually around the writing um but I, I decided to try this and I think it it's turned out really well conflict of nations world war three you could speed up its destruction by clicking the link in the description what a dumb state. I'm always scared to bring animals into my animation biz because it's just harder to move around their bodies. Like I've kind of gotten down my little cartoon characters. So like Life Lesson Leopard here, you see how his arm goes upside down there. So I had to erase this all. And well, what I did was I copied the arm layer because I have a separate arm layer. I flipped it vertically so it's upside down. And then I erased the joint here, had the uh, underneath layer still normal, and then erased this part of the underneath layer and then recolored it so that it showed that his arm 
arm was like flipping upside down and had the light side going up. It's just harder to do when you're like animating a person or when you're animating an animal compared to a person where all you have to do is just erase a black stick limb and redraw it. So, but, but I think it came out looking nice. Did I say Life Lesson Leopard was a he? I meant she. That's kind of how I envisioned Life Lesson Leopard. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. By the way, I know it's a long- Thank you to my patron supporters. Amber's in here. Thank you so much, Amber. Are any of you else in here? Is Friday still in here? Thank you guys so much. It really means the absolute world to me. Uh, it's crazy how much you guys have supported me and I really appreciate it. It really helps me keep going. Um, also, Wait. so little Easter eggs. I always have little messages at the end of my videos that are just sort of like eerie, creepy things. And so I like to switch that up every time. These are new every single time that I do it. Um, and then I usually don't do a voiceover at the end. That was a new thing I tried this time. And I said basically that I'd be streaming as this goes live, but I couldn't because it ended up going live while I was at work. So I couldn't, but I'm doing it now. And Ace, you don't have to support me seriously. Like just watching my videos is plenty of support. I really appreciate it. I, I'm not asking for anyone to go an extra step. I'm only letting people do it who specifically asked me if they could. So don't get too worried about it. But yeah, thank you guys for, for watching my videos. And um, this was fun to do. I should do more commentary streams when I post a video. But you know, it's not going to be all that often that I post videos because they take me a long time to do and I work a full-time job. But I, I do it nonetheless.